and I pray that I don't get to see my maker until every blessing that has been promised and every blessing that has been lingering and every blessing that has been suspended has dropped in my life. And I don't know about you, but I'm preparing to receive it. I'm preparing to receive it. And that's what my burden is. The Lord has me burdened about this. And it's burdened for me and you. And it's what I want to teach about. It's the conclusion of let the church say amen. And I want to conclude with this where we left off. But where the Lord is taking us tonight is that this teaching is going to end in laboratory. We're in lecture hall right now. But when we end tonight, I want to release it into the lab. You know, in the lab is where you put to use and to practice what you've learned in the lecture. And, and so I want, to, I want to spend a moment to teach. I'm not going to teach very long. There are three key principles I want to release in the room. And then I want to ask God that he might do this work in our lives. I think I left off in Roman numeral two. And uh, sub point B is, I believe, where I left off. And so let me read the passage of Scripture that we're studying from, and then we'll talk about it together. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And y'all do know this is why it takes us like a whole year to get through a book of the Bible, because, I mean, it, we're still in chapter 1. Verse 18. But as God is faithful... A word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen to the glory of God through us. That's that's all I want to cover. Um, But we'll read down to the end of the chapter just so we get it all in. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Verse 21. Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us, given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is a guarantor. Amongst all the else he is in our life, he he co-signs on the promise. So that even when I have moments of doubt and struggle, there is resident in me, living in me, a guarantee. It says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. And so where we left off last week is talking about the promise. Everyone say the promise. And I want us to really get that in our spirit. And so I want us to be mindful that Really, what is the impetus of this? What is driving this passage? Is God communicating to all of us that I have a promise that I've put in your life? And what I hope will happen by the time I'm done teaching tonight is that all of us will take a moment, if we can't get it done tonight, that before the week is out, you'll be clear about what that promise is for you. And then that we we become diligent, I'm getting ahead of my teaching already, that we become diligent in pursuing God until that thing he promised is a reality in my life. I'm going to hold him accountable for everything he promised he would do. You can say amen to that. And so the question in letter C now where we left off in our handouts is what is the promise that still needs to be fulfilled in your life? And I want, I want to put a pin in that, and I'm going to pull it out at the end of Bible study. This Bible study is about the church learning to say amen. It is about us worshiping and trusting God in a scriptural way. 
It is about how we go beyond our liturgy, meaning the elements of our worship, and how we get beyond culture, how we get beyond denomination, how we get beyond tradition. It's how we begin to practice our faith in the way the scriptures teach us to practice our faith. The scriptures teach us, Old and New Testament, that when we are clear about truth being with me, truth being in me and around me, that it is not simply a nodding of it, acknowledgement of it. It is a verbal acknowledgement and confidence in it that gives me the ability when it is communicated to me to say amen. And when we begin understanding, even in the beginning of the Old Testament, that not only did the people say amen, they said amen and they lifted their hands. And so it is a statement of like, God, I'm hearing you for my life. Which is why as I minister tonight and as I minister on Sundays, it's gonna be different amens out of different lips. Because it's about what is resident in my life, what God is saying to me. So when we say amen, I want us just to be clear, it is declaration, it is affirmation, it is exclamation. When we say amen, we are saying truly. We are saying surely. We are saying so let it be. Are y'all following me? When we say amen, we're saying, God, I know you're reliable. Because see, it doesn't count as a good amen if the circumstances don't look like it's unlikely. What makes it a good amen is when God spoke the promise and the circumstances don't look like the promise is going to become a reality, but you have so much confidence in God that you know he said it, and so you know he's reliable, even though the things around me aren't reliable, and so even though everybody around me might be doubting that it's going to be a case, I'm still hearing it and receiving it for myself, and I'm saying for me, because I know he's reliable, amen. And that's what we need to get to. That's the whole, con- that's the, pre- it's, it's, he's trustworthy. It is what the praise team sang. Who would not serve a God like this? It is that I know he's firm. It means I know he's steady. It, when, I, when we say amen scripturally from the verb sense, it means may it be. When we say amen as the adjective sense, it means he is true and he is faithful. He, he's the great amen. He is true. He is faithful. So, so amen can be verb, amen can be adjective, and then amen can be adverb, and it just means truly. So it's about learning to say when the truth comes forth, amen to what God is communicating. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 6, just jot that down. We don't have it on the screen for you, but... Let me read it to you, Nehemiah 8 and 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And then all the people answered, amen, amen, while lifting up their hands. Come on, let, let's just try it. Come on, amen, amen. It just, it, it, that, that's what this thing's supposed to look like. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, amen, amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord. See, amen and lifting of hands is an act of worship. Because I'm having confidence that he is reliable. He is trustworthy. He is worthy. And so I want to say a few things about what happens as, as I'm a beginning to then realize this this blessing, this promise that I'm going to say amen to. A couple things. This is on your note sheet. The first thing that I need to do is I need to identify the promise. Everybody say identify it. Now, I'm going to be very personal tonight because I want this thing to live for people. And I want you to see it, an example of it in action. And so in every one of our lives that's in this Bible study, that's going to watch this Bible study that's online, You don't realize it yet, but there's something specifically from the scriptures that God is promising you. Not people. This is why, as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says all of these promises are in him. Right? And they get a yes and an amen. They're in him. So in all of our lives, there's something that God is speaking to you. 
something scripturally that he says, I want you to take hold of this and I want you to hold on to it until you experience it. Um, let me give you, I'm gonna give you a couple examples for me personally, because what happens is, go back to the beginning of the note sheet under the, the big, the promise settles our hearts. That's the big line. You see that in Roman normal two? Y'all see that in Roman normal two? The reason this is important is because as I preached on Sunday, life is hard and disappointing. What holds us together is knowing that there is still a promise lingering over me. That's the thing that settles my heart. It is the promise. In all of our lives, God has promises that he speaks. They're different for all of us. I'm going to teach you in a moment how to kind of hear him better as we get down the sheet. Um, I was in my um, early 20s. Um, I, had, I was a minister, um, but not a particularly, you know, not particularly that active in church doing stuff. Had been every church I, every church in a vacant pulpit in Philadelphia that I felt led to apply for. Most of them didn't even give me a return phone call. Um, this was the this was before email. Right, this was you know old school waiting for the mail to come or getting a phone call. This is a very true story. I want you to understand how this works. And so I was very disgruntled. I was working my job in ministry, just you know, not but not really wanting to pastor, but the Lord not opening up any doors and and not getting really any support. It was before I met Pastor Hall, and um, I just was very down and doubtful. And I went to a conference up in the mountains in Pennsylvania. And the pastor who was preaching is no longer with us. You know, there's a deliverance, evangelistic church of deliverance in, in Weldon, right? So what you may not know about evangelistic church of deliverance, they're part of a reformation. That church was birthed out of a church in Philadelphia. And, um, and so I'll go to a revival um, that the pastor preaches from Deliverance Evangelistic Church in Philadelphia. And um, he lays hands on me, and, and the next thing I know, the service was over. I was the only one left in the room. And I, get, I got up, and I went back to my room. And I went back to my room, and I remembered I wasn't doing anything much in ministry at all. And I, I fell asleep. And the Lord woke me a few hours later, and he spoke a word, a specific passage of Scripture that I had personally never preached, never studied, never even maybe read it as I read through the Bible. He spoke very clearly. See, my feet felt like they were on fire. And so I woke up to try to put the fire off of my feet. And the Lord, I could hear him say, I have given you the tongue of the learned that you might speak a word in season to those that are weary. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. I left the mountain, and a few months later, I met Pastor Hall. And the Lord began opening up doors. But every week when I'm writing my sermons, I remind the Lord of Isaiah 50 and 4. You promise that you would give me the tongue of the learned, that I would speak a word in season, to people that are weary. And I've learned to hold on to that so that when you're not preaching to crowds of people, the promise is what settles your heart. When, when the sermon don't come out quite like you want it, it's the promise that settles your heart. And so there are passages of Scripture that you have to identify, not just you willy-nilly in it, I'm not talking about what you hope he gonna promise you. I'm talking about what he has promised you. And so that began the pr primary word that the Lord spoke to me about ministry. It's the one I hold him accountable for to this day as I minister the word of God. That God, I need you, you promised you would take me beyond my studies and beyond my degrees and beyond what I've learned and that the people that are weary would hear something from you. You promised you would do that. That was the first big 
scripture the Lord identified for me. The second, and there's several for me, it's four or five, but I'm going to give you a second one, and it's Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis 12, 1, we've studied this. The Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family. Now y'all know why I'm here and not in Philadelphia. He said, get out of your country and from your family, from your father's house. So plain, I'm going to show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. This is the part. And make your name great. I literally hold God accountable to these promises he speaks over my life. Uh, what, I'm trying to use me as an example because he's no different for you. I didn't do a great job. I'm catching up a little bit. I didn't do a great job making sure I was financially as equipped as I wanted to be when my children went off to college. And I remember people joking with me and teasing me about it, and they said, what's your, what's your plan? How are you going to pay for it? And I would say to people, my plan is my name. And they were like, what kind of plan is that? And over the years, I have watched God open doors for my children just because their dad made the phone call. So it's not for me. And all I'm trying to get you to see is that you need to identify the promise. And you gotta hold on to that baby. So that's your homework assignment. Is identify the promise. Um, Proverbs 18, 16 was the third one for me. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. And then there's still one the Lord hasn't done yet, but. I'm holding on to it. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. You gotta keep holding on to it. I'm, one, I'm deliberately taking my time tonight because I really want the Lord to release something in our lives, but you have to identify what you want him to release. So number one, I need to identify the promise. Secondly, I need to believe the promise. <laughs> you got to believe it. He, he, he's going to speak it when the circumstances are contrary to the promise. He's going to speak it when the winds are opposite of what he said, which is what faith is all about. Having the ability to believe him when all of the odds are against you because it's in him that it's yes and amen. It's not people that are making the ultimate decisions. It's in him. Man, when God is willing to do something for you, man, can't no stakeholder stop it. I mean, I'm not gonna get in no big fight with y'all right now about this, but if you don't believe, look, near the impossible is possible, just ask NC State right about now. Who expected them? Matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, that coach, he was, wasn't going to have a job if he had lost the first game in the round. And, but my, here's my point. When God is for you, it does not matter what all of the odds are. I just have to have a willingness, and I'm not trying to tell him. I'm not saying that God said he was going to give him an ACC championship because that ain't in the Bible. But I am telling you that God knows how to make you a winner. God knows how to speak over your life that if I am for you, it's worth more than the world against you. God knows how to speak over your life that despite all of those that may be against you. But I have to be able to, I have to, be able to identify that I have to believe it. I have to, and then here's where it gets hard. Because everybody say yes and amen. Because what he spoke is yes and amen. Because he spoke it, I have to identify it. I've got to believe it. Here is where it gets hard, Dwight. It gets hard because I have to wait for it. And we don't know how to wait patiently. We, 
We wait with an attitude. We wait in resignation and frustration. We wait in laziness. I have to learn to wait in patience. Now, let me, let me park here for a moment. Because most times when we think about waiting, we think about inactivity. That's not biblically here what waiting is talking about. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite. See, it does not take a lot of faith to hear that you're sick and to lay down there and, and I'm gonna do as little as possible and I'm just gonna wait on the Lord to heal me. That's not the waiting he's talking about. The waiting I'm talking about is I got the diagnosis and I keep moving like I didn't. I don't know who that's for. I don't know who. I, it, see, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, let me tell you what waiting is. Waiting is the power to work under stress. It is the power to keep moving, the power to keep trusting. It's, it's when I have this deep anguish in my spirit and I'm still doing daily what God called me to do. This is the kind of, y'all, this is the kind of grit and grind we need. Let me stop here for a moment. God honors grit and grind. We, we got to stop all this thinking God only honors prayer life. No, God honors folks that trust him enough to keep moving to keep trying, to keep making an effort. I've got pains in my body, but I'm pushing through anyway. I'm doubting even myself, but I'm putting up a good fight. That's what God is looking for. That's patiently waiting. I mean, patience is less exercised in the sick bed and more in the street. That's where patience is exercised. So I have to, now this is hard because we're not good at this, right? But no crop appears overnight. Nor, does, nor do any of us control the weather. So I have to be willing to identify it, believe it, and then wait for it. Amen. And then finally, after I've done all of that, I can receive it. Amen. And so I want to minister this for a few minutes tonight. And then we're going to get to the end where I'm trusting God is going to release something in our lives. Amen. If not tonight, beginning tonight. It may take a couple more days, a couple more weeks couple more months. A fulfilled promise requires faith and patience. Now, I want to minister this just for a few moments. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. I said a fulfilled promise. Faith and, I'm going to say it again, a fulfilled promise. It's not, in order for the promise to happen, I must exhibit Faith in God and an ability to wait on God. Isn't it funny how we want to shout, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. Meanwhile, we're not waiting. Let's, let me spend a few minutes with this. Hebrews chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Matter of fact, I want to go back to verse 10. Go back to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to see this in action starting in verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Go back one more time. For God is not unjust. This should be encouraging somebody. He is not unjust to forget your work. That means when you're thinking nobody's paying attention to your, 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 how diligent and devoted you've been, God is like, I'm not like people. I'm watching how faithful and how consistent you are. I'm watching how you're grinding it out, and I am not unjust. I am not going to forget your work. 
Let me tell y'all something. I'm convinced that some of the people that don't know why God has released a blessing are the same people that can't show consistency in their work toward him. I'm not unjust. Write down the word, get, find your a side on your side of your sheet. Write down the word devotion. God is saying, I am not going to forget your devotion to me. I'm not going to forget your devotion to your family. Speak, Pastor Gail. I'm not going to forget your devotion to those students. I'm not going to forget your devotion to your job. I'm not going to forget. Never mind the fact that they don't seem like they appreciate you. God says, because man will forget your devotion. And man will be unjust toward your devotion. But God says, I will not forget it. So there is an element of devotion attached to it. Let's keep reading through this. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. Jot down, I'm giving you three words to jot down. Jot down devotion, now jot down diligence. My devotion is my doing it unto God. My diligence is the consistency of which I do it, which means I do it even when I'm not apparently getting a reward at the moment. This is going to help everybody in the room when your name don't get called out, when folk don't say thank you, when they don't acknowledge you on the program. Don't worry about it. God is not unjust. If you are devoted to him and you are diligent in what you're doing, the promise is going to be released. What I, what I wish, I, I, don't, I don't have many regrets in life because I have not found them to be helpful because you don't get it to do over anyway. So why let it drag you all down, right? It, it, was a, it was a miss. It just was what it was. So I don't have very many regrets in life. And this is not a regret on me. This is just like sometimes I'm like, God, man, I wish we had some of the stuff then that we do now. So like, I really wish, like I wish I had cell phones 25 years ago when I started ministering. Because then you could see pictures. Because the problem is folk only see you now. They don't see the diligence and the devotion that God was responding to. It, they, they, see, they don't, they don't, they don't, we, I, I'm on the board of trustees at um, Elizabeth City State. We had a board meeting today. And um, so we had to approve all of our athletic, our coaches' contracts. And so they bring them to the board. You know, we had to approve our new basketball coach and the volleyball coach for the girls and the basketball coach for the girls. And so we're going through their contracts. And then they, they you know, the athletic director is selling us on why we should approve these contracts. And he starts walking through like this guy's resume. And you see how well he's doing now, but you start hearing about, you know, all the AAU teams he's coached and all the elementary schools he worked with and all the middle schools he coached. And like literally they're telling stories about, about these folk that we're renewing, these, giving these contracts, how many of them volunteered to coach. Yo, they, they, were, they were spending their money on another job to apply to the team they were coaching without no compensation. I'm going somewhere. That's why you can't put your mouth on somebody for how much they made or make because you don't know all they have volunteered, all they have given away, all their diligence, all their devotion for all those years. You don't know that God is finally taking a look and saying, I saw you the whole time and I am not going to be unjust toward your devotion. And so what I'm trying to get you to see is that, is that he's not unjust. He says, he says there's got to be a devotion, there's got to be a, a, a diligence. Verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. This is the third word I want you to write down. Devotion, diligence, now write this word down, duplication. 
that you may not, I'm sorry, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Gosh. Imitate those. You don't need a Bible for this one. Do you remember your grandmama? Duplicate. Listen, it says, look at what the Bible says. Don't get sluggish. Duplicate what you see. I mean, like, I, I, I don't want to get all teary-eyed, but, like, I want, to, I want to die like my mama. Like, she died witnessing. I mean, she died saying to the nurse, I know you okay, but I don't know about you. <laughs> she, she had 36 hours left. She was like, baby, I need to tell you about Jesus. See, you, you got to have some people in your life. Can I just minister this for a moment? If you don't have people in your life that you can't duplicate what you see in them, then you got the wrong people in your life. You need some folk in your life that when you watch their walk and their witness and listen to their words, you like, I'm trying to be like you. And if I got a bunch of folk in my life that I'm not trying to be anything like, I got the wrong crew circle. He says, look at some people that got the promise. And you can just duplicate what they do. And so a fulfilled promise requires faith and patience. That don't become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. But when God made a promise to Abraham, I want you to see, I'm giving you proof scripture. Let me stop for a minute. Sometimes one of the big mistakes preachers make, and I'm one of them, I try not to make this mistake, is anything that we claim to be true in the Scriptures, we should be able to prove it to you somewhere else in the Scriptures. Right? So it's called a proof Scripture. Where a lot of times ministers make their mistake is they, then they go to the proof Scripture and they don't never go back to the main Scripture. Or they claim something about the passage that they're teaching but they can never show you scripturally where they can prove it anywhere else. So then it becomes really their opinion and speculation about the text and not really about what the text is. Now, remember our principal text. Stay right there in Hebrews. Our principal text is, is for the promises of God, verse 20, in him are yes and in him, amen. Right there, in him. Now look at Hebrews, verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. <laughs> he says, I'm making this promise on me. Because I know my word is good. I know I'm yes and amen. He said, I ain't going to swear on your mama. That's foolishness. I swear on my mama. I swear that ain't worth nothing. He says, I swear on himself, by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Wow. Patiently endure. The promise is what settles our hearts. The problem is waiting periods, this is in your handout, letter E, waiting periods are difficult because our human nature falls into doubt and unbelief. Wow. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. We need, we need, we need eagle Christians. It, I mean, when you read Isaiah 40, 31, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
It starts with waiting on the Lord. The, our flight training manual literally teaches us that I will not fly until I learn to wait. So can I just use the same language as in the scriptures? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 32, it talks about this. In chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, verse 11, it says, and as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone. Led him. I mean, I don't have time to teach this in detail, but the eaglet, the eagle just literally with his wing pushes over the little eagle and he gets all like frantic and he's chirping and he's falling. And then before he crashes, the eagle swoops him up. And he takes them back up. And finally, about, this is going to help somebody, about the fourth or fifth time, the little eagle says, let me try my wings. And I want to encourage somebody, try your wings. You don't know how far God might take you. You don't know what my God might do in your life. Trust him. He won't let you crash. He won't let you fall. If it don't work at first, he's going to scoop you up, take you back again, and he's going to keep watching you. But I'm trying to tell you, don't be satisfied with just resting on him. I want to get to a point where I can fly on my own. I can advance on my own. I can get to the mountaintop on my own. But it takes time to learn how to work your wings. I just need to be patient. And so I've tried to share with you, first of all, that the promise is what settles our heart. Now, here's the second big thing, Roman numeral three. Now, once I get the promise, here's the second thing I need. I need a plan. Not an amen in the room. Because, see, we want to just sit on the promise and wait for it to come. But I told you, waiting is not inactivity. I'm going to say that again. Waiting is not inactivity. Waiting is stepping into the plan that God has given me. So the second big thing is not only the promise that settles me, but there's a plan that strategizes my steps. God, how do I begin working towards what you've spoken to me? So if he's spoken to you about and leaving an inheritance to your children's children, then that means I need to have financial steps. Amen. 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 It may come in my life insurance policy. It may be, it may, it's going, but I got to do something. You do know the Lord is not going to make any deposits in your life insurance policy, right? So I have to have a plan. So let me say a few things about the plan. First thing I want to say about the plan is that God's plan gives us a track to run on. Each of us, each of us have different assignments, different things that God is calling us to. And when the promise is yes and in him, amen, then after I have received the promise, now I've got to begin strategizing my steps so that it can become a reality in my life. And so it keeps me narrow. A laser, um, a laser actually emits less light than that does. Yep, it's less than that. The reason that's not putting a hole in my scalp is because the lights is not, are not directed enough. Laser is powerful because the light gets directed. And when it gets directed, it's more powerful. 
And oftentimes in our life, we are so all over the place that there's not enough direction to get me to do the one thing God might be calling me to do. And so I want to encourage us that the plan is what strategizes our steps, right? God gives me the plan to keep me on track. Let me say a second thing about this. The promise requires faith and patience. I'm going back to the first point. But the plan requires obedience. So now I need faith, patience, and obedience. Whew. Now I'm, now I'm seeing where I need to be praying. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us or besets us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Yes. I have to have the ability to run my race. No, don't, don't bypass what we just read. I have to have the ability to run the race that is set before me. Amen. Let me kill a demon or two. This is why we have to be really quick and careful not to be so judgmental about how people are running their race. You, don't, you may not like their pace, but it's not your race. You know what I see very little of? I see a whole lot of this. I see a lot of people in the stands commenting on the runners. What I see very little of are runners commenting on each other. So let me just help you learn how to tune out the folk up here. If you're not on the track where I am, and if you're not in the arena like I am, then keep your mouth shut because I'm not interested in any of your commentary about the race that I am running. Get, just get clear about whatever your race is and run that race. And you don't know how powerful this is. God, God, you might wind up with a bad hip and can't hardly move quick. God is saying, because I know you well enough to know that if I ain't slow you down, you might have wrecked yourself. And I've seen more people that can get more done with a limp than a whole lot of people can do running real quick. So, the God's plan gives me a track to run on, but the plan requires my obedience. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. God says, I've got thoughts for you. I've got plans for you. And that's what I'm trying to get us all to see today, tonight. John chapter 3, verse 26. Let me just share this real quick, and then I want to just close out. John 3, 26, and, and it's funny, I, I was on a call, I have a monthly covering call that we, we, we are on every month, and uh, so with Pastor Jenkins and, and a group of pastors around the country, and he will put somebody on the call to pour into us, and then we'd have a Q&A with them. And so it's always somebody remarkable, we had Tony Evans last month, and so last night we were on a call for, I don't know, two hours with T.D. Jakes. And he, he actually references passage of scripture at the end. And me not even putting it together, that was in my Bible study notes. And he was talking about succession planning, and he talked about John the Baptist and Jesus being the best example of succession planning in the Bible. And how it's so important that we have to decrease so that those around us can increase. And so in John chapter 3, verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm going somewhere with this, y'all. I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. 
Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is where I'm going with this. Sometimes your plan is to be less than the person you are making room for. That sometimes God's plan for me is not to be in the number one spot. I don't know who this is for, but it's a really... See, y'all, y'all don't like this kind of teaching because I'm, I'm sitting secretly wishing I get the number one spot. And God is saying, I know how to give you greater fulfillment and greater accomplishment at number two than you ever could if you had been number one. And, and so we have to be willing to accept whatever the plan is. Whatever the plan is, you just have to accept it. Like, God, I'm good with it. And so only Jesus... So you know she's let her see can fulfill God's plan perfectly. So let me walk you through this process. I didn't put any blanks in this on purpose because I don't want y'all being so preoccupied with filling in the blank that you miss what I'm going to say. And I want you to have it all for your future. This is the process. And then I have one point and we're done. First of all, God is going to speak to you and direct you. He really is going to speak to you. I want you to trust that you're going to hear him. He really is going to speak to you. He's always trying to talk to you. I want you to trust that. He's going to speak to you. He's going to drop something in your spirit. He's going to give you direction. Now, the moment he does that, it's my time now. I got a sense that he's speaking to me. I got a sense that, God, you're saying something to me, and then I have to go seeking after him in that. God, I need clarity. God, I need confirmation. God, I need further understanding. God, I need to really understand what you're saying. So he speaks and directs. I'm sensing it. Then he's going to say, good, let me talk to you again. So he's going to speak to you again, and he's going to put you in a body. Not the body there, a body of believers. So a lot of times, this is where people mess up on the promise because they hear God speaking, they sense he's speaking, but then they want to operate independent of a body. But the next thing he's going to do is he's going to do with you in a body. So he's going to direct you, put you in a body. He's going to say, look, while I'm dealing with you, I want you at this church. This is how you're going to know. This is going to be for your family because I know most of y'all are wordites. He's going to be like, you're going to know because when you go there, you're going to hear me. You're going to feel something. You're going to know I'm dealing with you. You won't just be sitting there idly. You're going to know. Then I now, now he puts me in the body. Now I got to go do something. So I start praying because, I, see, I didn't know how to pray at first. But I'm in a body now. I'm around other people that can pray. So I start praying. Nobody ever said anything to me about fasting. Now I'm, it's Lent time. I'm fasting. Now I'm learning to put all my stuff aside. I'm starting to humble myself. I'm learning how to submit to leadership. I'm learning how to do some things I don't really like doing. I don't really understand it. I'm humbling myself. God watches me again. And God is like, you're doing good. But now I got to correct you. I, I, he starts disciplining me. And he says, now you need help, so I'm going to put people around you. They're going to be praying with you. They're going to be encouraging you. He says, then I'm going to start helping you think different. I'm telling you, this is life-changing if you get it. I'm going to start renewing your mind. And then I'm going to make your will match mine. Then I'm going to sit back and be like, this feels good. Then I'm going to have peace with what he's saying. And because I have peace with what he's saying, I'm going to start pursuing it. The moment I start pursuing it, God was going to be like, huh, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. I'm glorified in that. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to bless you. That's the process, y'all. That's the process. I I want you to get that process in your spirit. 
That's why you can say all of his promises are yes and amen. I guarantee you, you go back over your life and you go back through that little series that I just put together for you. And you're going to be like, that's where I blew it. I just said so much more than you rely. That's where I blew it. That's what I have to do different. So there's a promise that settles me. There's a plan that strategizes my steps. And here's the last thing. There's a power that secures my victory. Whew. Tell your neighbor, the power belongs to God. I... So let me give y'all this last point and we're done. Satan has a lie to attempt to undo every promise. So for every promise the Lord spoke to you, Satan has a lie to try to get you to not believe it. But what's going to secure it is the power of the Holy Spirit. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in, in, in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is good. Look at verse 22. Here's the power. Who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Can I give y'all old school church song that used to prove this verse? Still does prove this verse. Let me, this is the old school church song that proves this verse. I got a feeling. Everything is going to be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Can we could do that a cappella real quick, all? Come on. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I got a feeling. Everything's going to be all right. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Be all right. That's the Spirit of God that gives you the guarantee. That's the spirit that gives you a guarantee. So here you are. It's at the end of your note sheet. What are you ready to say amen to? I got a whole list for you. When you find one that I speak out, just jump on your feet. I'm ready to trust more. I'm ready to be more patient. I'm going to take better care of my health, my prayer life, my boldness, my time, my service, my mentoring, my humility, my wisdom, my generosity, my strength, my honesty, my money. I'm ready to say amen. I don't know about y'all, but God, whatever you want to do in this area of my life, I'm saying yes and amen.